my fellow gnomes, and welcome to episode 15 of Doors. So today, what we're going to be doing is adding the ability to revive ourselves, because at the moment, if we die, well, we're going to get this die message, and we can just restart, re-teleport into the game, but we haven't really got anything else. Now, if you wanted to add a spectate system, I put out a video a couple of days ago, and that was really covering a sort of generic use case that you could use across all different sorts of games. Now, it's not exactly the most perfect fit for doors, but what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go and I'm going to copy and paste in that script. So into my on death GUI, I've got local death and now local spectate. And this is all the same code as I show you how to do in that video. So go and watch that video if you want to know about building this spectate system. The only difference is at the very bottom, you'll notice I've added this script wait for child toggle event. And inside of my local script, I have this bindable event called toggle, which I then use to then call the toggle spectate function. And the reason I'm doing it like this is so that from my local death function, I can then interact with what's happening in this local script. So if we just take a look at our UI for a moment, um, we've only got this one button at the moment. Uh, if we set it to visible, just called restart. And really, I want to have a couple of buttons. So I'm just going to uh, delete this and I'm going to add in this one I made earlier, a frame containing three different buttons. So if I set this frame to visible, you'll see we've got an exit button, a revive button and a spectate button. And then I'm going to paste in my spectate frame that I made in the other video as well. So if we set that to visible, we can see there we go. We've got two arrows to switch between the player. So if we hide this for now and then if we go into our local death script, and we need to change this reference to the restart button. So instead, let's make sure we're referencing the frame containing all the buttons. And then we can access the restart button. And I'm also going to do the same thing for the revive and the spectate. And this spectate button is all well and good, but we probably only want to display it if um, the player has actually got somebody to watch, right? Because if they're just doing it on their own, then who are they going to spectate, right? We don't want that. So let's move all this uh, death logic, just so it's a little bit clearer what's going on, into a new function above. We'll call this on death. And I'm going to move all of this code into there. So then we can just call it from humanoid.die connect on death. And then just after we type out the try again message, let's check uh, is there anyone alive in the game? So local alive players initially we'll have that equal to zero and then we'll just loop through each player so for i player in game dot players get players do and if that player we get an attribute and if that it they have the dead attribute and if that is true then we will ignore them and continue on to look for someone else who doesn't have the attribute and if they don't then we can add to this by one so then button spectate dot visible is dependent on whether a live players is greater than zero. So if this is true, then this will be visible. If this is not true, then we will hide it. And now before we hit the restart button all the time, we're going to have it always visible, but then it's parent frame FRM buttons we're going to have hidden. So this time we say FRM buttons, that's the frame, and we set that whole thing to visible and then we'll toggle which ones we want to display within that frame. Now, just as we don't want to be able to spectate if there's nobody in the game, we also don't want to keep watching people if they've died. So in our local spectate script, where once we've checked that they're not our player, let's also check if that player, if they have an attribute of dead, then we will ignore them as well. Now, previously, we were having to rely on references to uh, buttons and then toggling it within our spectate script. We're not doing that anymore. We're just calling it purely through the little toggle event. And so the only event functions we have is for the next player, the previous player, and then hooking in to the bindable. We don't need to react to any toggles or anything like that, any toggle buttons. So now we just need to make sure we're reacting to the player pressing the button from our local death script. So in our script, doesn't really matter where, but we can add in somewhere here. 
button spec tape dot activated, connect that into a function. And then I want to hide btn spec tape dot visible, set that to false. And also the revive button, I'm probably going to set that to false as well. I need to disable the image static dot visible, set that to false. The txt message dot text, we want to hide that too. And then those sounds we're playing, uh, if we remember, we have script.death and script.music box, which are both in sounds inside of here. We want to stop both of them as well. So we'll call the stop methods on each of those sounds. In fact, we could even create a function for this called like function end death effects. And then we can take this, 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 and this, and just pop that in there. So we can just call it then here. And then all that's left to do is to fire off this toggle bindable. So if we go script dot parent dot local spectate dot toggle fire and we'll send true to enable it. And so then the toggle spectate method will be called. So now let's go and test with some players. Just check this is all working. So we now have two players. So if player one goes into the room and he goes and has a terrible accident. Oh no, look at player one, he's dead, what a terrible shame. And then he's got his options, exit, revive, uh, spectate. And if he clicks spectate, he's going to find himself in the spectate mode. And he can run along. Admittedly, he can see himself respawned here. A little bit weird, we might not want that to happen, but that's fine for now. And he can follow along anytime he likes. But as soon as, um, let's say, this guy dies... He's going to exit out of spectate and he has the option just to exit the game at this point. We probably want to clean that up later, um, but you can see the player on the left because there's no one else to spectate. Well, he hasn't got that spectate option. He can only exit the game or revive, which is what we're going to work on next. So let's clean up all these windows and react to them pressing that revive button. So in our local death script, we've got the restart button, the spectate button, and now we're going to say btn revive dot activated, connect that into another function. And then we want to prompt them to purchase a little developer product. So first thing, we've got to go and create one for ourselves. So I'm inside the Roblox create area. I'm on my game doors tutorial. You can see I'm absolutely crushing it for all the stats. But if I go down to the monetization section, find developer products, I haven't got any at the moment. So I'm going to click to create one. We'll call this revive. You can add an image for this if you want and a description too, but most people aren't even going to see this description, to be honest, it doesn't really matter. And a price we can add in, something not too expensive, maybe something like 10 Robux. Then just go ahead and click Create. And once you're done, you'll see this little sort of moderating image. It means it hasn't got an image anyway at the moment, but if you click these little dots and copy the asset ID, because that's what we're going to need. So now we go to the top of our script, make sure we're referencing marketplace service and then when they press that button we want to prompt product purchase and paste in that id and we need to send in the player as well that local player so now when i'm dead and i click that revive button i'm going to get this little pop-up buy item would you like to buy revive i can see the image i added and 10 robux uh, we can purchase it inside of studio because it's a test purchase and your account will not be charged as we can see so we can click that, but obviously nothing's going to happen, right? We need to process them purchasing that item on the server. So if we go into our server script, and at the top, we're going to want to access marketplace service again. So we could just copy that from our local script into our server script. And then right at the bottom, we're going to write marketplace service dot process receipt and we need to assign a function that runs every time somebody purchases something in our game so we we'll set that equal to function and that's going to give us some info that we can use first thing we want to do is actually grab the player so the info gives us the player's user id so if we get game dot players get player by user id we can get that by info dot player id if we were successful in getting a player, then info.productID is going to tell us that ID that we've sent from the client. 
and we want to run a function that corresponds to that. So a handy way of doing this is you create a global table called product functions. And then inside of product functions, we can create using the ID. So if we copy that over from here, copy it, make sure we're copying exactly the same ID, paste that into our service script. So we're placing it into our table, a function, which is going to require the player. And for now, let's just print out purchase successful. And then we can call this function by accessing it from the table product functions and index it like so. But we don't want to call it uh, straight away. We probably want to wrap it inside of a pcall. So a handy way of doing this is we set this to a variable and then we can say local success result equals a pcall. We pass in that handler, which is a function. So that's got to be the first argument to the pcall and then any data that we want to send as an argument to this. And we've only got the player. So we just send that player along that we've got from here. Now, if that function returned successful, so we'd probably want to return true from there, then we're going to return an enum, return enum dot product purchase decision. And what is it called? Purchase granted. Else, if something went wrong, we'll warn fail to process and we'll send the, we'll dump the info and the result that we got back from the P call as well. And then at the very bottom, so remember, if this is successful, then we're going to return, which is granted and exit out of this function. But if this isn't true or this isn't true, then we'll end up down here at the bottom. And in that case, we will return enum dot product purchase decision dot not processed yet. So something went wrong somewhere. We don't know. We don't want to bill that player. So if we try and purchase now, hopefully we should see in the output, your purchase of Revive succeeded and down the output, we see purchase successful, but obviously nothing's happened yet because we need to do all of that in our side of this function. So the first thing we want to do is we want to set that dead attribute. So player set attribute dead. We were setting that to true once they died, but now let's just set it to nil. Now, presuming they've died and their character has respawned, they're going to be back in this room, which is not ideal. So we want to send them back to uh, where they were, right? We need to get their character. First of all, character equals player dot character, or we wait for it to load in if they're still in the midst of respawning. But now we hit a snag because we don't know where to teleport them, right? Um, previously, when we've teleported people, it's been inside of the context of some other event that's happening. So we already had the number, um, but now we, we don't know what number room, right? We have the generated rooms table, but we don't know where to send them. So to do that inside of our player enter event, let's add on what is the furthest room. So if we had a global called something like current room number. Initially, that's going to be equal to one. Well, technically zero, I suppose, because you start off in the very start room. But then after that, we're going to want to add to it every time they someone enters a room. So in our player enter event, we can say current room number equals the number that they've just joined. So now we have this global reference. And so we could an access when they die, we can get the room from generated rooms and current room number. So now let's get a C frame to uh, teleport that character to. So the C frame is going to be, we're going to use the room dot entrance dot C frame. And then I'm going to offset that by, I think maybe like 10 studs. So they're not exactly standing in the doorway. And then also we need to rotate it around because remember, just like with our bacon, right, those entrance parts are facing backwards. We want the player to be facing forwards. So we use cframe.angles and we will rotate them by math.rad 180 degrees on that y axis. We zoom out. There we go. So now we have that C frame. We can say character pivot to the C frame and make sure that you don't get the one in blue like I have. We need to make sure it's that lowercase one. So we're referring to our variable. 
And once we've teleported them, let's make sure that we update their max door reached um, attribute. So character set attribute max door reached. And that's now going to equal the number that we've, sorry, not the number, but the current room number. And we could even print out a little has teleported at the very end of all this. So if I go into the first room, maybe into the second room even, and reset my character. Now I am going to be stuck with the UI because we haven't done anything about that. But if I just switch onto the server for a moment, we can see I have indeed uh, respawned back in the start room. But and if I click revive, make the purchase, it succeeded. We can see has teleported is in the output. If I switch over to the server, you can see I'm no longer there. I'm actually standing over here. So on my player, if I was to disable uh, the UI for a second, where is it? On death. If I just turn that off, we can see, there we are. The music is still playing in the background. Um, so let's disable all of those effects now on the client once they have revived. So to do this, we're going to need the use of a remote event. We'll add in a new one and we'll call this something like revive player since that's what we're doing. And then inside of our server script, we just need to reference that. So replicated storage dot events dot revive player fire client. And the client is the player who purchased it. And so then inside of our local death script, make sure we're referencing that. So we've got the teleport event and now we want the revive event, which was equal to events, wait for child, revive player. And then we can just wait and listen for that being activated. So just below here, revive event dot on client event, connect that into a function. And what do we want to do? We probably want to hide all of those buttons. So FRM buttons dot visible, set that to false. We want to do all the same stuff as before with those ending the death effects. Right, we want all of this to happen. We want the sound to stop and such like. So we can call end death effects. Saves us from typing all of that stuff out. And then one thing to bear in mind is if we die again, then we do want to actually trigger all of this death logic again. So let's just grab our new character. Now we don't want this to be local actually. We want to reset this for the character and humanoid variables that we set at the very top. So if we remove local, we're actually going to be, rather than setting a new variable, we're setting the value of this one at the top, because this is local to the entire scope. Whereas if we'd made this local down here, we'd have made it local to just this little block. So we've updated the character variable, and then we need to update the humanoid one too. So character wait for child humanoid. And just like we had humanoid dot died here, that's not going to run anymore because that's for an old humanoid that has been destroyed. But we can copy this and do this just inside of here now. So now that new humanoid that we've created, when that one dies, we're going to connect that to the on death function again. Let's see it in action. So playing through the game, going through the first door and the second door for good measure. But we're not going to enter the third because it's too scary. And we're just going to give up and respawn. Maybe this player just really wants to give us some money. So they hit revive. And when they do that, all of the UI disappears. Cool. And we respawn in just slightly forward of that second door. Now, at the moment, I've set it up so you can have infinite revives. You might want to have a cap on that. A good way to do that would be to set an attribute maybe of the player of how many times they revived. And then if they revive too many times, not allow them to do it. But that's really a working revive system, which brings us to the end of this video. So thank you very much for watching, and I will see you in the next and I think final episode. Goodbye!